Good afternoon. Stephen, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And an honor. I think that you all know Stephen Roach. He's a brilliant economist, <clears throat> a former vice chairman of Morgan Stanley. He has a deep knowledge of uh, many things, including, including Asia. Now you are a senior fellow of the Jackson Institute at Yale. We were there together, and that's where I yeah. got to, to know you. Uh, Stephen Roach is one of the specialists in Asia and in China. He has public, published extensively in the matter. So given the interest on China here at Columbia and SIPA, it's really a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Stephen, now there's a consensus less positive or even negative about China in many aspects, economic, social, political. That being said, you, you are on the other side. You are still optimistic about China. Who is right and who is wrong? Well, I, I, I hope I'm right, but you know, it wouldn't be the first time that uh, that would not be the case. Uh, and thank you, Manuel, for, for inviting me here, and thank you all for coming at a time when, um, there, you know, Columbia is like Yale. There's always 20 things going on at once. I see that I'm competing with Sheila Bear, who's at the law school right now, right? I mean, why would anyone even want to go see her? No, I, uh, <laughs> um, she's very interesting. And has, you know, had a great seat at an important time in the crisis. Uh, China's an export-led economy. There's no export-led economy in the world that's not slowing right now. And, you know, <coughs> China would be the first to admit that it's not an oasis of prosperity in a, in a weak global environment. But I think the slowing is very important for China because this is the second time uh, in four years where China's growth model has been challenged by a major external shock. The one four years ago was horrible. The you know, worst recession uh, since the 30s and the Chinese growth rate uh, slowed um, from 14 to um, about 6% in the short span of, of, of two years. I mean, th this was you know, imagine you're, you're, you're driving down uh, an expressway at really high speed. And, you know, you don't stop, but you slow to uh, a moderate speed. The deceleration uh, can almost throw you through the windshield. And so China had what I believe in late 08 and early 09 was the functional equivalent of a hard landing. The sequential GDP growth rate went to a very low single-digit number. Over 20 million um, migrant workers in one province, Guangdong province, were laid off. Uh, and, um, you know, all the, var and the various gauges, but especially exports, which was the engine of the Chinese economy, in the short span of six months went from plus 26 to minus 27 percent year on year. So th this was China's dreaded hard landing, and now here we are four years later, there's been a slowing, and it's a big one. But the slowing has gone from about 11 and a half to seven and a half so far, so thus far it's about half of what China went through. And <coughs> yet, you know, it, the, the concerns that are being raised over China today uh, actually seem uh, much larger uh, and more serious than the concerns that were raised uh, four years ago. Maybe the rest of the world was in such horrible shape that um, they didn't have time to focus on China. But it's, you know, you, you can't pick up a newspaper or magazine or, you know, a serious um, international journal without hearing stories about um, uh, uh, the downside risks in, in, in uh, China. Uh, there was an article I read today, maybe it was um, FT, a good friend of mine, David Pilling, 
uh, great columnist on Asia, but used this um, riot in in Foxconn uh, in in the n the North recently as an indication of how uh, precarious the, the social equilibrium is uh, in uh, uh, Chinese factories, leadership issues. Um, you know, the presumptive leader Xi Jinping was missing for two weeks. I mean, you know, it goes on and on and on. And, and you hear a lot more negativism uh, uh, about China. And then, I mean, um, how many of you listened to the debate last night? Did you, you all listen to the debate? You know, the, you know Romney is out there, you know, ch he likes to use the word cheat. Uh, and... Um, there are a lot of people who use the word cheat. I mean, I, I uh, appeared in front of the U.S. Congress last May to testify on some China trade issue, and, and my my friend um, uh, Fred Berkston, you know, the uh, the head of the think tank, he, uh, like he likes to use the word cheat. Um, and and uh, you know, Obama is certainly uh, lobbed a, a series of anti-China. Actions in recent weeks, WT, another WTO case, um, denying the investment in four wind farms in Oregon for national security. I mean, I, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, but, you know, China is a big topic in this country, and, and uh, that that is not surprising in a political campaign, but, but given the tough state of affairs in the U.S. economy that is likely to persist well after the election, you have to worry about whether or not we're, we're really at, at the brink of uh, a, a more serious outbreak of uh, anti-China uh, political and economic sentiment in the U.S. So uh, there's a lot of stars that have come together that have raised a lot of concerns. You asked me why I'm so positive, because I think um, while there are certainly a lot of challenges uh, for China, uh, strategy is very important to China. The strategy is well articulated, has been so, uh, not always, but for the last 30 years, beginning uh, with a fifth five-year plan in the late 70s, uh, post-Mao, post-Cultural Revolution, uh, when Deng Xiaoping drove through reforms and opening up, the strategy of the successive five-year plans has generally been a fairly coherent statement of the challenges that China wishes and needs to address. And the 11th five-year plan enacted in 2011 uh, was precisely the plan that was that, that China needed to truly fathom and understand the significance of these two external demand shocks, because the eleventh five year plan is it lays out a framework to shift the model from external to internal demand I mean by this by, by now we all know this, but the urgency to embark on the transition was underscored by the massive shock of four years ago and the aftershock we're living through right now. And so you, you can envision that my baseline case for the, uh, the global economy is that the major developed economies, uh, starting first with Japan, now the U.S., and now Europe, are going to be in very weak, uh, s decidedly subpar, sub-trend economic growth trajectories for a number of years. So if you're an export-led economy dependent on selling things to the developed world, how are you going to grow? And the 11th five-year plan says, here's how we're going to do it. And so these two shocks really light a fire under the, uh, the government to uh, move ahead on the plan. And the final point I'd say on this is that is what really puts the challenge on the new fifth generation leaders that are about to take over. 
Uh, I break down this 30-year miracle of China uh, basically into two blocks. The first 20 years was driven by aggressive reforms, largely ending with the WTO accession in 2001. And the, the current generation of, of leaders, which is about to uh, turn over the reins, uh, did not really push the ball ahead on a variety of reforms. The strength of modern China in its transition uh, is a fair amount of risk taking driven by reforms. And there's a huge agenda, unfinished business on reforms that needs to be embraced and I think the new model in conjunction with these two powerful external demand shocks leaves me very optimistic. And I, I think, um, you know, this is, this is the moment for the new leadership to, uh, to shine. And, we, you know, we don't, as, as is, I, I was going to say, is typically the case in a leadership transition in China. But the truth is we don't have a lot of experience with how these leadership transitions go. So it's, it's hard to extrapolate on the basis of uh, a past uh, leadership changes, but one would hope, and I hope, and I've, I've heard all the good things that a lot of you have heard about Li Keqiang and, and uh, Xi Jinping, uh, but the burden of proof will be on them to seize the moment, and I'm hopeful they will. My own experience about China is very much marked by the two months that I've spent there in the summer, and I should say that it was fantastic. I was really amazed with uh, what I've seen. Uh, I was only in Beijing. I traveled to Arbin, a city in the north, close to Siberia. Um, income per capita of Beijing is five times higher than the poorest uh, region in China. And this shows that inequality is a problem. Uh, I was checking that there it's is a problem here too, right? Didn't you see the debate last night? It's it's one percent versus ninety nine, right? Yes, but um, <laughs> the the richest state in the um, in the U.S. is Maryland. It's twice income per capita of the poorest state, which is Mississippi. In China, the relationship is one to five, and inequality is a challenge that uh, must be addressed. And I'm sure that it will be um, addressed, but more than reading books or reading papers, being there for, for, for two months was a very, very interesting experience, uh, getting to know these young people. I had two classes, about 80 students. Uh, <clears throat> and something that surprised, you know, I come from a country, until I was 21, there was a dictatorship. So I know, I know what it means not being allowed to speak. In my classes, it was surprising because students, they discuss everything. And I would say that even they discuss a bit too much. Uh, then not only students, but uh, all the people I met, they are obsessed with politics. They are obsessed, they are very proud, very proud with the uh, achievements of the country. They, they feel very, 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 very positive, but they speak very openly about what remains to, 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 to be changed. In my view, the fact that, recogni that they rec recognize that some things have to change, uh, it's a very important step. What was the most, uh, the strongest feeling that your students had about what needed to change the most in China from, from their point of view? Uh, before answering to, to, to that, I will give you, I made a kind of poll in, uh, in my class, and first I asked, I had 80 students, how many were single child? 80. And they spoke very openly what it means not to have brothers and sisters, something that I don't know, probably you don't know. And they, I learned what it represents, and they are aware of, for example, being somewhat spoiled, but also of not having someone to whom communicate. That was number one. Then they were extremely attached to, to, to the family. Out of 80, known, not, not one would take a very important decision without consulting their parents and their grandparents. The role of the grandparents is very important 
in the Chinese society. And now that they have to, to, to now the, the, the world economy has problems, they face important challenges, having strong family bonds, it's a plus. Then I asked them, what's the country you admire the most? And that was a big surprise. Because over 50% out of 80 students, their idol, you know, was Germany. That's Germany. How come? Well, eventually it's industry, it's strength, it's discipline, it's experts, uh, it's audits. I mean, they, as you know, they crave for, for uh, audits. But the fact that f more than 50% of the students uh, said Germany was the role model. Then I asked, did your parents own a car when you were born? Out of 80, only one? So this is really the generation of, uh, of change. Finally, I asked, would you like to be a millionaire? And I will not tell how many. Said, ah, we want to be a millionaire. What does it mean, millionaire? For them, it's a billion. So <clears throat> this was a surprise because now it shows that the world is not black and white. It's also in shades of gray. These kids, they are uh, ambitious. They are very positive. Um, they, they know that something uh, has to change. They mentioned the inequality. They have a problem, the, the cost of um, housing. When they go to the job market, now after leaving college, they will face very high prices for buying a house, so they will have to rent. That was a, a, a problem for them. Um, I would say that personally, and you know, I'm very positive on, on, on China. And I'm very positive because there was not I think that Deng Xiaoping never imagined that the results of his reforms would be so good. Neither Deng Xiaoping nor any Nobel Prize. The fact is that now China has a very strong track record, not only of success, but of being able to correct the mistakes. Yeah, but here's, here's the challenge, and it's, it's a big one, and I'm hopeful that China is up to uh, the task. <coughs> what Deng Xiaoping was able to figure out, and in large respect, he basically had no choice because China in the mid to late 70s, the economy was on the brink of collapse. You know, all of the grand experiments from the Great Leap Forward to uh, many other you know, industrial and agricultural pushes under Mao had, had backfired. And so the reforms and opening up uh, was China's desperate uh, strategy to save itself from failure and did it by creating in an amazingly short period of time a powerful producer model. And the producer model fits with the legacy command and control structure of the, the old state planning commission, which has now been inherited by the NDRC, the National Development Reform Commission in China. And, and the combination of high saving, and the mirror image of that is repressed consumption, uh, together with incentives to attract foreign capital, technology, uh, and to mobilize a rural workforce to staff factories at amazingly low labor rates, it built a producer model the likes of which the world had never seen. But what does it know about a consumer model? And this is what I get asked a lot when I go to China. Now they consult with me in a, a variety of different ways, but the consumer model is not the DNA of the modern uh, uh, PRC. So I tell them, you know, from a macro point of view, you got to do three things. You've got to build up a new source of job creation because if you look at the 
job to GDP ratios in China, you'll see that while China leads the world in GDP growth, it lags most Asian economies in terms of net employment growth. Uh, and it's because it's a manufacturing-led model where you deliver productivity by capital labor substitution. It's labor saving. Generates far fewer jobs per unit of GDP. And so it needs more units of GDP to compensate, to absorb the surplus labor. And those units are very resource and energy and pollution intensive. And so this creates a lot of problems uh, for China. And, and so what I say is the first piece you've got to put in place is to move away from labor-saving manufacturing to labor-intensive services. And there's a whole menu of choices that China has in the services area because their service economy is tiny compared to the scale of uh, the, the, the nation and the level of prosperity they've attained. And there's a lot they can do quickly there if they put their mind to it, especially in the distribution industries like wholesale trade and retail trade, domestic transportation, supply chain logistics, some of the transactions processing pieces of those industries. They can do that quickly and they don't need huge investments in human capital to staff the functions. But that's only one piece of the equation. Uh, they've got to continue the unprecedented push to urbanization. And it's been, you know, talk about an unprecedented trend. You know, in, in 1985, the, the urban share of the Chinese population was less than 20%. Last year, it moved above 51%. Give you a way of comparison. India knows they need to urbanize. India and China had the same urban share of their population in 1985. India's moved from a little less than 20 to 30. You know, pretty impressive. But China's moving from a little less than 20 to over 50. And the forecast suggests, you know, another 20 points by the year 2030. Urban workers make three times as much as rural workers, provided you can find them gainful employment. So the urbanization must be coupled with services-led development. Out of those two um, strategic pushes, you, you can certainly do the math and come up with a scenario that gives you much higher labor income generation, which is the essence of consumer purchasing power in China. But then that raises the third issue, and that is, you, you know, you can give people a lot of income, but if, they're, if they don't have a safety net, if they don't have any financial security about how they're going to live when they retire, how they're going to cover their medical care, the income will not be spent. It will be saved. And this is, you know, this is the, the, the real uh, conundrum for uh, an insecure uh, household sector in China. Savings rates are high and still rising. And so the third piece is really to fund much more aggressively the social safety net in China. And the emphasis in the last 10 years has been expanding the coverage, the number of workers who are covered by Social Security, the number of the population that's covered by their new nationwide medical care system. But the benefit levels are minuscule. So the challenge, I think, in the, the structural transformation is daunting. More jobs, services, higher wages through urbanization, more security through the safety net. And the Chinese get this. You, you study the 12th five-year plan. All of these strategic points are made. But then you, you look at the progress that's occurred in each of these areas. And, <clears throat> you know, in normal times, I'd say good report. You know, they're, they're, they're talking about it. They're laying out um, some uh, 
uh, proposals for study, and they're definitely moving ahead and uh, debating many, if not all, the points I just made. But do they have the, the luxury to, um, what's the Chinese expression? Um, I just think we might cross question. the river and feel, uh, feel the stones go, go so gradually. Uh, two global demand shocks in four years says this is not a time for gradualism. So I come back to my point I made initially. This new fifth generation leadership has to be bold, it has to be aggressive, it has to move quickly, not incrementally. And you may think, oh, it's pretty hard to turn a super tanker around, you know, that's going at a pretty high speed in the ocean. Um, that's, that's, that's the biggest risk in China, is that they understand what has to be done, but just too slow to pull it off. You mentioned very interesting uh, uh, issues. Uh, I will start with uh, <coughs> cities. Beijing is a very impressive city. It's a, a city who is built around six rings. Uh, the center is as well equipped or better than Manhattan. But in New York, when you get to suburban areas, you have Queens, you have Jamaica, I mean, you have neighborhoods that are not top quality. In Beijing, by the six ring, it's still top quality housing. So China, in that aspect, has progressed in a manner that I could not believe. Uh, I, an issue th I discussed w with my students was the, the for, as you know, uh, Chinese students are number one in the world in the PISA test in mathematics. However, there's no single Chinese university in the top 50. So the education system will have to change because they are very strong at memorizing, at wor work ethics, but when it starts, for example, students expressing them themselves in the class, it was not always very easy. I asked them a question. What will be China's GDP growth in the next 25 years? And they were embarrassed because they are very proud and very anxious that GDP growth may decelerate. And we made a deal, 25 years, 6%. Uh, it's interesting because the figure that the IMF uses in the World Economic Outlook is 5.7%. And I made back out of the envelope calculations. If China grows on average 5.7%, 5, 5 how will the world look in 25 years? In terms of size, the difference between the US and China will be the same as Germany and Italy. So China will be Germany and the US, Italy. In terms of income per capita, China will lag a lot behind. The difference will be uh, equivalent to the US and Argentina. And in my view, this is important because one main reason for the progress of China is the advantage of backwardness. China is still only 25% of income per capita. In, um, sorry, 18% of income per capita in the US, 25% of South Korea. And when a country lags a lot behind, or there are huge mistakes in the economic strategy, or huge blo block in terms of the institutional framework, or it's meant to, 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 to progress. Now, the Chinese are, as you know, obsessed with economic strategy, and they are open to recognize their mistakes. Now, the new leadership, I mean, it's lived in a very interesting manner. They know that they will have to change. The objectives of the new, of the 12 uh, five year plan, now creating a new model based on a knowledge economy, uh, promoting the new industries, energy. I'm a so called specialist in energy. Energy is, for someone who likes energy, China is a paradise to, to, to be. Because China will be responsible for one third of the increase in energy demand over the next 25 years. China will produce- And how much of the CO2 emissions will China account for? It will be responsible by one third 
of the increase in CO2 emissions in the world. So one, one for one. One for one. That means that even the new five-year plan is not enough. But when we see what China has to change in the energy area, it's impressive. And in my view, there are two conclusions to, 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 to it's on China's benefit to change, not in many areas, including energy, but it's also in the interest of the world. Because there are externalities. China, in the last six years, accounts for one third of world GDP growth. So if China does not perform well, it's not only China's problem, it's our problem. It means that if China now enters in a recession, we should not forget that between 95 and 2005, China accounted for 20% of world GDP growth, around the same as the US. But in the last six years, China accounted for much more, one third, and that directly, because indirectly, uh, after China, I went to Australia to see my daughter. Now, Australia is a new country, and there is a number one, two, and three, China. Because they are selling a lot of natural resources. Uh, Australia is rich in natural gas and coal, and the demand from China and the immigration from China has changed radically. Uh, I was in Brisbane, and they are destroying buildings that are 25 years old, because the speed of construction is so, so fast. And the only reason, believe me, is China. So what is happening in China is on the interest of China, yes, but it's also in our own interest because China uh, has been the engine of growth. Uh, um, if China makes mistakes, for example, in the energy area, we will pay that with uh, externalities, CO2 uh, emission. So I think that the word should be not only cooperation, but having hope. It's in our own interest that things in China turn out well. Anyway, let me, let, let me can I just let me just show you just three quick pictures, um, if this works, if I can get up to. These are all great pictures, but I'm going to skip them. Um, well, okay. This you know this these are just a couple of slides that show the. Um, three main sectors of China, the, the, the engines of the miracle, exports and investment on the left, and the sector that's been left out, uh, the consumer on the right. And it's juxtaposed against the, um, the observations of Wen Jiabao um, five years ago, pre-crisis, where he said, uh, before he saw you know, any of these gyrations here, that he was worried about an economy that was unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, ultimately unsustainable. So lo and behold, you know, less than a year after he said it, uh, it all came to pass. The, the proverbial imbalances hit the fan and the, um, the growth engine collapsed <coughs> and lacking in support from internal private consumption uh, China did what it had to to uh, recover massive uh, investment-led stimulus, which took investment up uh, from 40 to 47 percent of GDP, unprecedented. And a lot of the China bears, and there's you know zillions of them right now, say no country has ever done uh, sustainable growth with an investment share this high. You know there are ghost cities, bridges to nowhere. It's it's you know rampant misallocation of resources. This is, I hear this all the time. So I'm going to come back to that in a second, but um, you know, here's the the framework that I just um, tried to articulate earlier in terms of what the, the the strategy is in terms of jobs, wages, financial security, and what China is trying to accomplish with each of these initiatives to shift the model uh, into a more balanced. Uh, increasingly pro-consumption growth dynamic. As I said, I don't underestimate the challenges to do this. But services is, is, is one of my favorites. I, I just finished writing over the summer a new book on China, China and the U.S. I spent a lot of time on services. And, you know, the points underscored here are pretty simple. 
tiny services sector, 43% of GDP targeted to go up to 47 over this 12th uh, five-year plan. Even then, it'll be tiny. Uh, but here's the deal with services. <coughs> These are jobs per unit of GDP, services, manufacturing, construction. Every increment of services GDP in China generates 35% more jobs. So you can, your students can get their 6% growth, but that 6% growth under a more balanced services-led model is the equivalent of, you know, 8, 8.5% eight growth if they just stayed with this. And by the way, services, far less resource, energy, and pollution intensive. It's a very powerful antidote for so many of the imbalances that China has had to face over years. Urbanization, second piece of the story. I mean, look at what China's done. As I said, you know, early 80s, less than 20, now up to 51, estimated, you know, in 2015 to be 55. It'll blow through that probably in a couple of years. Urban workers on the right make three times those what uh, the earnings are made in the, <coughs> in the city. So, but you've got to couple the urbanization with the, the services-led job creation. And then finally, <coughs> at least on this piece, urbanization is what underpins the so-called excess investment uh, of China. Those who tell you that no country can sustain you know, 47, 50 percent of investment without a collapse miss one critical point. They're focusing, you know, in economics we talk about flows and stocks. Investment's a flow. But look at the stock. This is what drives productivity. This is what drives economic growth. The stock of capital per worker in China is down here. 25,000 bucks per urban worker. Less than 10% of Japan. China can be a high investment economy for a long time because it started with nothing 30 years ago. Zero. Post-cultural revolution, the stock of capital per worker was basically zero. So, as long as urbanization is central to what China's doing, you may, you may not like the way the, the investment funds are allocated by some, you know, bureaucracy called the NDRC, uh, but that's their choice. That's their system, and that is their strategy, and it's centrally tied to urbanization. I'm not worried about excess in an excess investment economy in China given this chart on the right and given the urbanization trends that are in place in China. And then finally, you know, this is the safety net point. Savings high and rising for households, rural, urban. No surprise, no funding of the safety net. You know, this is a few years ago. Uh, national Social Security, local government, private pensions, add them up. $470 of assets per worker to fund lifetime retirement benefits. I mean, money goes a long way in China, but $470 is probably not enough. So the government's got a lot to do to address these three pillars of the new model. But again, I, I go back to you know, the, the, the reforms and the leadership challenge, and I just want to stress again this is one of the pieces that's most overlooked and it's getting a lot of attention in China right now because it allows the, the economy to do labor absorption by growing more slowly uh, and in that slow growth, uh, less in the way of pressure on resource energy markets and on the environment. And so I think this is increasingly urgent from China. I know on the basis of the work I do with the Chinese that there's a, a big effort underway in uh, laying out a blueprint for services development in partnership 
with foreign multinationals. And in the book that I just finished, I spent a lot of time in trying to document the potential bonanza in the development of Chinese services over the next 20 years. And what that means for growth-starved services-intensive economies in the developed world, especially the United States. We need, you know, we're, we, we got a growth problem, in case you haven't checked. Uh, we have a serious jobs problem. We need new sources of growth. Uh, and we've tapped out, we're the opposite of China in so many ways. But we've tapped out our biggest source of growth, the consumer, and that's likely to be tapped out for years to come. And so the China externally dependent needs to go internal. We are internally dependent. We need to go external. China is our third largest and most rapidly growing export market. Uh, and there's huge opportunities cross-border for our services companies to get involved in China, provided the leadership seizes the opportunity and, and opens up uh, the services sector. I wasn't going to go through these charts, but, you know, why not? Can I show just one or two? Yeah. So this is an image from the Forbidden City. <clears throat> I found that it's, I don't know, what does it mean? Exit to the East, Prosperity Gate. I don't know what the, does it mean. Uh, when I came here to Colombia, now three years ago, uh, I was puzzled because China was not a very hot topic. And now things have radically changed. And the e Economist has published this last week. It's a poll. Uh, who is the world's leading economic power? Five years ago, 45% of the people that respond to this thought it was the US, 22% China. Now, 42% think that it's China. 36% the US. So there is a here a radical change in perception. And we know that in nominal terms, China's GDP is ca catching up very rapidly, uh, that of the US. And this probably will happen by the end of the decade. But I find this interesting because it shows a radical change in perception. And one may ask, is this for cyclical reasons? I mean, the subprime crisis, the crisis in Europe, or is it for structural reasons? In my view, we should not forget one thing. In 1980, non-OECD countries represented 26% of all GDP. In 2010, they already represent 45%. And using World Bank and uh, IMF estimates for the next 25 years, whatever they, the, the, they mean, the so-called West will only pre represent 40% of all GDP. And this is an historical transition. China is very important in this story, but it's not the only thing that matters. Uh, all the natural resources producers matter for this. India matters, but this is an historical change. Uh, in the debate yesterday, I was surprised by the small number of references to China, because the people I spoke with in China, either top people or the students, they, they were expecting that China would be bashed in the, the, during the, the electoral campaign. They said, well, in October, we like very much America, uh, America is a very important partner. I mean, so many Chinese students are here. But in, in October, we will try not to hear, because during the campaign, they will say that China is evil. It's the worst thing in the world. But then in November, when there will be a new president, or 
the existing one will be reelected, things will go back to, um, to normal because now the reality is that China is an extremely important partner of, um, of, um, of the US and Europe. I wonder what would be, for example, I'm European, what would be Europe's export industries without China? For example, the Chinese are money acts with Audis and Mercedes. Hmm? Uh, so it's by miles their number one uh, market. I mean, the, 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 all the, the Italian and French fashion, I mean, you, you see these department stores, I mean, it's a luxury. I've never seen anything uh, in my life. So the first thing, the first point I would like to make is China is part of a general process, but this is a change of historical proportions. Then, uh, so this is my poll. Uh, then, here. Comparing China's income per capita to that of the US and Germany and South Korea, we can see this two ways. Okay, China is still a low income country very bad, or very good. China still has the advantage of being very far from the frontier. If they get it right, either by expanding the services sector, by correcting institutional problems they have, the scope for progressing is huge. Another point that I find, I find interesting is that China's success is an example that so-called Washington Consensus is not the only development policy and probably not the one who delivers the best result. In terms of doing business, climate for, for doing business, China ranks 92 in the world. So if we see what is the best country to do business, it's Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, you have Germany and Japan, 29 and, and, and 19 and 20. Mexico, number 53 in, in the world, Botswana, 54, Uruguay, 92, China, uh, Uruguay, num, num, 91, China, 92. Where, where's Portugal? Uh, it's out of, out, out of class, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> Portugal and Spain, now they, they were uh, uh, out. They were taken off the list. They, they were taken off the list. <laughs> um, so, China, I mean, they invented their own model. That turned out, I mean, it's not standard, but it worked very well. And they were able to correct mistakes in the, um, in the process. So if we use our standard tools to predict the future of China, it will be like in the past. I mean, in my view, we will uh, miss it. Now, this comparison of, uh, so in 25 years, this would be China. This would be the US, this would be the US, and this would be China, big country, relatively poor country. And uh, when my students thought about uh, uh, a rate of 6%, this means that in 25 years, China will grow by 3%, almost as fast as the US. So it's not, uh, it, it assumes a, a strong, a strong, uh, now on China's challenge, and this would be the, the last, the, the last uh, slide that I would like to, to, to show. Well, one, income and urban-rural disparities. This is something that the Chinese discuss, problems of inequality and problems also of inequality among regions. For, now, I only know Beijing, so I don't know regions where income per capita is five times as low. This would be... <laughs> a new world, so my, my knowledge is, is uh, very limited. Now, external-internal rebalancing. This is, we can see this in two ways, in my view. One is the dimension of the current account surplus, which now has been reduced to 2% of GDP, is lower to that of, of, of Germany. Hmm? And then is the structural rebalancing of demand. Uh, do we see any obstacle for that to happen? No. And the five-year plan 
I mean, it's, it's very high on, on, on the agenda, so why should not believe that that can happen? China has a good track record in economic management. It may seem impossible, but the point is that they have achieved this. Uh, you know, as an economist, I would say it's impossible that they grow by 10% for 30 years in a row. It's impossible, but the fact is that they, 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 they have uh, um, uh, done it. Uh, so an area important, corruption. Corruption is an area where, I mean, it's a big challenge. Um, and education, there's a, if China wants now to change its economic model and develop the new industries and uh, become more services oriented, I mean, the education system must change. It's still totally dominated by, by, by the state. I mean, it's very good for basic skills it's less good for skills who require more capacity to communicate and to and to and to create. And finally, the problem of uh, um, use of resources and of the environment. Now, uh, uh, the environment is not global warming; it's pollution. I got to Beijing one Friday at five o'clock in the morning, and the air was really dark. I said. Whoa. I mean, I could not believe, I mean, pollution is really dark air. Huh? So, but again, is this bad or good? Probably it's good because for the Chinese, it will not be an abstract discussion about global warming. It's day-to-day -day pollution. Uh, I also visited Hong Kong. In my view, Hong Kong, there's much more pollution now than it was, than there was five years ago. You've lived in, in Hong Kong, didn't you? I mean, I think that you can. You can confirm it's much more pollution. So if China does not address very seriously this energy and environment problem, it will be the world problem, of course, in terms of CO2 emissions, in terms of energy prices. But it will be, first of all, the problem of being impossible to, to, to live in China. Now, my argument is the following. By rational, ra rationally, these challenges are so important that it's difficult that China will be successful. But their track record is so phenomenal, is so phenomenal, and also their track record in correcting mistakes is so great that why should we not have hope? I would not say that I'm um, positive. I, I'm positive. I have hope. Uh, I'm not pessimistic about China. Okay. Um, that's great. Well, I think we should <coughs> open this up a little bit um, to, to the group here um, and, and get, why don't we start with you. Oh, it's so intimidating to get these people to get up, it's late. Oh, yeah, oh, whatever you want. I shouldn't say what to do. <laughs> ah, there you yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Um, you mentioned the potential on, on um, uh, services in China. Um, my question is, uh, are there some services which are mentioned as priority services to develop uh, in, the, in the new uh, five-year plan? And my second question is, um, what are the obstacles that you see for foreign companies to develop services uh, in China? The obstacles, I think, are primarily at this point uh, regulatory, where the, I mean, we know this, I've spent most of my career in the financial services area where there are, there, there have been real battles uh, in terms of setting up joint ventures with uh, Chinese partners, uh, restrictions on ownership stakes, uh, licensing, issues with respect to certain products. Um, and the, the same is true in um, the distribution industries uh, right now in China, although there's rapid expansion uh, for uh, many of the major chains of, of retail outlets for consumers. Uh, I think it's just uh, honestly a question of <coughs> uh, doing it almost on a local government by local government, provincial government, 
by provincial government uh, uh, level rather than necessarily trying to do the blueprint at the national level. Uh, coastal China is um, reasonably well open to um, retail distribution, especially for high-end luxury, less so for middle and low-end luxury. Uh, hotels, leisure, hospitality, these are all areas that uh, have grown rapidly in recent years in the showcase cities, but not in the nation as a whole. And the, the network of wholesale distribution is primitive relative to the size of the consumer base in China. And I think the government needs to be very aggressive in opening up uh, the distribution system to uh, uh, foreign transportation and delivery companies as well. So I think it's a question of strategy, deregulation, and um, implementation. If I may just add one thing, two sectors that in my view are especially important because the, the, the impact would be very positive is healthcare and basic education. Uh, because that explains also the very high savings rate in, um, in, in China. I mean, people have to pay um, health care. Uh, it's almost impossible to find a place to, to live a, 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 a young kid before they go to, 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 to school. These are two sectors. Probably the strategy would be to develop that at the regional level and gradually open up, opening up to the um, to the rest of the country, but healthcare and education are two areas that, in my view, could be, I mean, easily liberalized with large benefits, direct and indirect, for China because it's, for example, health, it's a problem for for the for the Chinese. The, the I mean, standard hospitals, they don't provide good services. The good hospitals, they are extremely expensive, so they have to 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 save, to 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 because they can face a, a, an adverse situation. Yeah, thank you very much um, for, the, for the presentation. And I would just be interested in the very beginning, you were talking about this um, social equilibrium and about possible fragilities in this social equilibrium. And I would just be interested what your perception on this is and also with regards to economic growth, how this might um, change change things in the social equilibrium if you think um, in general the Chinese population would move more towards a more um, more, more fragile um, state or more to more yeah I, I'm not nearly as worried about uh, China being on the brink of social upheaval as many are uh, I'm really not I think um, you know, there, there used to be uh, annual data published on the number of um, protests or demonstrations and it got a lot of attention, so the government decided it was probably not appropriate to continue publishing the numbers, uh, so they don't publish the data anymore. Uh, there's been some analysis of uh, the sources of protests, the, the um, major issue had to deal um, with the land confiscation associated with uh, rapid urbanization. There were uh, protests over uh, corruption, state-owned enterprise led downsizing, uh, and more recently there have also been some protests over uh, environmental uh, degradation. And you know, you read when, you know, the, there's a riot in a Foxconn plant uh, that involves 2,000 workers, it, it makes it sound as uh, David Pilling wrote in the FT today that this is emblematic of all of China. And there are certainly um, incidents in China, as there are in other countries, of worker unrest and unsafe working conditions that have, have elicited <coughs> uh, very powerful protests. But I just go back to the, the basic point. This is a nation whose 
pretty new at economic development, and in 30 years have taken uh, per capita incomes up 30, 40, 50 times. Uh, and <coughs> your students, what they say, of 80 students, um, one of them had a car when they were growing up. They all have cars now. And I don't, I don't mean to say that you can bribe people with material things uh, to um, deal with social discontent, but I think the, the livelihood of the average Chinese family and individual uh, has improved significantly. And let me just say one other thing that I think is very important, and I focus a lot on this in, in my uh, new book, is the role of the internet. Five years ago, China's internet user community was half the size of America's. Today, it's more than double. I think the latest numbers um, put the internet si uh, the size of the internet user community at about 515 million at, by the uh, the middle. I should say by the end of 2011. It's higher than that now. Yeah, the internet's filtered. Uh, and quite frankly, I know you're going to hate me when I say this, but there are times when I wish the internet were filtered in this country because um, I think, um, and there are polls, you showed these Pew Research polls, there are polls that, that show how polarizing the internet has been in the United States in terms of um, fostering an environment of political uh, extremism, for example. But that's not the point. The, the point is that uh, the internet, while it's filtered, allows for connectivity uh, in something that China's never had before, and that's a, a broad national communal network that links uh, central and western China to coastal China. It's very important in the consumer story that I tell in, in giving a sense of what national behavioral and consumer norms can look like. Uh, and it's a, a very important expression of, uh, and an avenue, a vehicle uh, to um, discuss tough social issues. Like all discussions in China, the government, the censors, you know, they have, they have boundaries. So if you push the boundary, you, you'll get a powerful message that you shouldn't do. And if you push it hard enough, there'll be consequences. But one of the things that surprised me the most about my experience in China in the last 15 years is that the boundaries of expression, and you said this about your class, are a lot wider than I had thought before I spent time in China, and they are expanding. And yet, there are, sure, there are limits, but I think the government has recognized, <coughs> and this is possibly one of the really trickiest aspects of moving from the producer to the consumer model, that you have to allow freedom of choice and expression and upward mobility and engagement amongst the broad population of citizens. and the government has let the internet do it. Not in an uncontrolled way that fuels a lot of extremism, uh, but in a way that really, I think, brings them closer to uh, connecting a heretofore very fragmented society. And that may be, you know, one of the big sparks of the, the transformation to the consumer model that we really don't appreciate. And I say maybe because it's, you know, it's sort of fuzzy. It's hard to know. But, you know, as, as somebody who's as an economist, I've studied major transformations of, of economies for the better part of my career as a professional economist. And all of these great stories, whether it's, you know, the Industrial Revolution in Europe, its impact in the U.S., there's always a spark, a technology, you know, an idea, an innovation 
that really is an important part of it. And maybe this is China's spark. <clears throat> I think I have the mic, so if I may ask the next question. Thank you very much for coming. I wonder if you could comment just a little bit more on sequencing and bottlenecks. I agree with you about services and the underdevelopment of services and the recognized need for uh, uh, growth through services. But if you're a conservative government planner uh, or economic policy maker in China, uh, as an economist, what do you say to him or her about the sequencing? And can you ascribe sort of the growth impact and the job uh, impact of uh, specific service sector reforms such that they can develop uh, sufficient confidence around what to do next? Because uh, there's such broad brush discussion one hears about health care, you, know, uh, you know, education, et cetera. And I think uh, there is a, uh, a, a kind of paralysis around the question of sequencing. And, and, uh, and I guess the sort of related uh, question is, um, you know, one of the consequences of the, uh, 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 of the response to the global financial crisis was a slowdown in reforms, as you suggest, and particularly, I, th I think, some you know, further uh, embedded uh, aspects to SOEs. And I guess uh, 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 I wonder, as you think about moving to this consumption model and services, where SOEs fit into that? Wow, those are, um, those are wonderful questions and, and tough ones. And you know, a lot of them are really unanswerable, uh, a chicken and the, and the egg type scenario. I mean, China is pretty transparent in, in believing that of the three building blocks that I mentioned, the one that has been in place the longest and they're continuing to focus on is urbanization. I'm not saying it should go first, but the Chinese have told us that so far it is going first. And by taking the urban share of the population from you know, 20 to 50, in less than 30 years and trebling the per capita income of urban inhabitants relative to those in the countryside, it makes sense. But you can't just keep moving poor people into cities without addressing jobs. So the time has come to really make certain, and I have this discussion, I'm sure you do too, with the Chinese all the time about uh, the, the, the job creation imperatives that now are tied to urbanization. So I think services is, is fairly urgent in that regard. I think the Chinese have told us that of the three that I laid out, and perhaps this is unfortunate, but the safety net is last. They're very proud of having built a national social security fund and a national almost universal health care insurance plan. But they're sort of shocked when you ask them about funding levels. And yet a surplus savings economy has huge resources to inject public funds into all of these activities and they haven't done it. And, and I, I ask that question a lot and I don't get good answers. So of my three building blocks, uh, the order would be um, urbanization services uh, and the safety net as the Chinese have revealed their preference for moving ahead with this model. Uh, if I were uh, sort of given the chance to rearrange the deck chairs a little bit, 
uh, I'd, I'd move very aggressively right now with public injection, with inje excuse me, injection of public funds into the safety net institutions because I think the precautionary saving motive needs to get shocked by uh, a greater sense of confidence that uh, the income that's being generated can actually be spent, not by rich people in coastal China, but by those more in the middle income uh, stratas in central China. But it's, it's a really tough and um, a critical question. Um, thank you for <coughs> your <coughs> presentation. Uh, what uh, is the upside for, for the Chinese of, of those uh, uh, founding uh, blocks? Because sometimes uh, you get the impression that it's not about the, the substance, but about the opening up uh, of, of those uh, uh, of the jewels in the crown, because those are uh, the service sector is where th there will be uh, uh, a lot of a growth potential. Well, that's where one that uh, two billion people uh, use services. But sometimes you get the impression that it's all about opening it up uh, for the Americans or the French or who English, the usual suspects. Uh, to set shop there, and uh, I'm wondering, for example, what would be the, 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 the upside, and I don't even know if Walmart has set shop in, in, in China, but yeah. uh, 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 but, uh, but uh, the, the financial sector, I mean, why? To teach them how to uh, uh, bring financial instability, like in Iceland, Hungary, Spain, uh, Argentina, in the bad old times of the 90s? Thank you. Look, just, just briefly, and I forgot, I, I was trying to think of, there was another piece to your question that I, I, I lost track of uh, late in the day, but you asked a lot about the SOE reforms, which is sort of related to uh, what you're saying. There, there is, you know, an important power equation in China uh that you're both alluding to in in your question and that is a lot of these reforms whether they're in china or any other country uh forces existing puts pressure on existing power blocks uh and is that good or bad i i think we like to presume that the deeply entrenched power blocks to the extent that they can exercise monopoly power over markets and economies um, need to be broken up in the interest of efficiency and growth, uh, productivity, and um, a more sustainable uh, income distribution. You know as well as I do, a huge debate in China right now about the fact in the last six or seven years, but especially in the last three to four years, the power has shifted back to a lot of the state-owned enterprises that um, have been uh, asked to relinquish power over the, the prior uh, 15 years. The new government's got to deal with that. Uh, there is no question about it. There's a, this is a huge debate inside of China. There's a report that was written earlier this year, published um, earlier this year by the World Bank, and <coughs> Chinese think tank, the DRC, DRC, that focused exactly on this issue. Uh, and this, a lot of this has to do with the, the fragmented nature of the power structure in China, that so much of the power still exists at the local and in some cases provincial levels and they don't want to let go. And this has got to come from the top and it's got to take courage to do it. Un the, Premier Zhu uh, uh, Rongji, who retired 10 years ago, was tough, and transparent, and aggressive in doing that. Uh, the current leadership has, has, has not been nearly as strong uh, in addressing that issue. And finally, you know, 
financial reform doesn't mean instability. China has, places a high priority on stability, social stability, economic stability, political stability. And it's quite possible to have a modern financial system that doesn't create the next subprime crisis. We screwed up, not because of market structures, but because of a regulatory and policy oversight that China seems determined to avoid. So I think they, they, they study this period very carefully. That doesn't mean they wouldn't make a mistake, but don't condemn the, the system for a lack of oversight by those responsible for the system, including, I don't mean to let my colleagues off in Wall Street who didn't do a particularly good job in risk management either. Uh, we were all involved in that catastrophe. Um, this is a kind of a similar question. If so I just make the, tell an, uh, for your, yeah. your question, just a, a personal uh, example that is totally what you said, it's lack of reform impetus. Uh, to open an account in China, it's a nightmare. Yeah, please. Uh, when I finish yeah. my classes, I had to be paid. And it was a nightmare. I think that I had to open five different accounts. Some at the car, the others at the book. You know, even now, I, I don't understand where had they have deposited the, 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 the money. Now, there's no, no re logical reason for banks not, I mean, to, to have so complicated procedures. It's just outdated, lack of reform impetus that now, I mean, sh should be put in the agenda uh, uh, again for people like us that are used to nor put standard banking services. I mean, it's a nightmare. I repeat, I think that I had to open five accounts and honestly, I, I don't have the faintest idea <laughs> where's the money that, that they have deposited. Um, so I, I wonder um, if the current, you know, one-party system is actually, you know, helping China's economic development. Um, because uh, as we can see, you know, China, you know, the one-party system, the, the government, a strong centralized government um, is extremely efficient in, you know, resource allocation of these. At the same time, you know, um, there is huge inflation and I don't believe the normal Chinese people are benefiting as much as sort of the numbers of GDP that China is growing. So I just wonder, you know, if a more kind of a more decentralized, more less involved Chinese government can actually be more beneficial in the economy. Again, look, I, I'm not here to defend um, a one-party system, but that this is China. Uh, not in my lifetime, but at some point there will be uh, political reform. The one-party system is well designed to deal with the producer model. The big challenge is, is it compatible with the consumer model? You could say no, or you could say, let's see how they do. My experience is that, um, and there's some interesting empirical work that uh, actually um, one of one of the, uh, the the authors of a very provocative piece is, is um, I can't remember his name, but I know he's a Columbia professor, that looked at the linkage between democracy and political reform and economic development, and they found, shockingly, that the correlation that lies at the heart of the so-called modernization thesis doesn't, doesn't come through the data. Uh, eventually, you could say there's no way that um, a one-party state is uh, compatible with uh, economic development and prosperity, but this research says that you may have a lot more time in dealing with the transition than you may think. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, 
and you give us three pillars of China's uh, economic development. Uh, but can you say the hurdles like the policymakers in China is facing or may face in the future in uh, promoting the policies, the three policies? And are there any trade-offs? Are there hurdles in um, implementing the type of plan? Or are you talking about more of the short-term hurdles in dealing with monetary, fiscal, and? both like uh, short term and long term in dealing with the three pillars? Look, policymakers are human beings uh, and they make mistakes. Uh, China, we do know that strategy and policy are designed and implemented much more by consensus uh, standing committee, whether it's nine or seven people and ministers of the state council, they tend to operate more collectively rather than be dominated by one or two people. <clears throat> so um, the 12th five-year plan is an example of that. While the standing committee is about to change in China, there will be two members of the standing committee that uh, have been on that committee through the design, enactment, and implementation of the plan, and those are Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang. So the idea that, that this is the fourth generation leadership's plan and now the fifth generation's got to deal with it is not entirely correct because the, the, the two new leaders of China, I, I'm, I'm presuming that they'll, they'll be anointed uh, within, a, within a month, uh, were, played a key role in the process. It's just a question now of What is it that drives a leader? And do they have the courage and the political will to push ahead and implement? And that's a question you can ask of the United States. You should ask that when you watch you know, debates for the presidency. You know, who is it that's going to really do what they say? Or you can ask it of China. Deng Xiaoping rose to the occasion. Is he unique? Is he, only, is he the only Chinese leader that, that had the, the will, the vision, the capacity to do it? Zhu Ranji, I think, was an outstanding example of somebody who took tremendous risk in pushing ahead many powerful reforms in China, not just WTO, but SOE reforms. But you know, and there were some areas in terms of corruption and transparency of the government where he failed. Wen Jiabao, I give him a lot of credit for raising questions about the sustainability of an unbalanced growth model. But what did he do about it? I give Wen Jiabao a lot of credit for raising the tough issues of political reform in China. But what did he do about it? So this new generation comes in. A, a, critical time for China. And I hope five years from now or ten years from now we won't be asking so what they do about it. Thank you all. I have to run. Thank you very much. <laughs>